Right, so hello everyone. On behalf of South Texas College Library and in co cooperation with the dual credit program, I'd like to welcome you to our webinar, Biotech Cat Microbiomes. My name is Heather Bobrowitz. I'm the programming librarian here at South Texas College Library. And I have the privilege to introduce to you today our guest lecturer, Dr. Sandra Porter. Dr. Porter is an artist, scientist, entrepreneur, bioinformatics geek, and a writer. She received her PhD in microbiology from the University of Washington, worked as a postdoctoral researcher at the Fred Hutchinson, Hutchinson whew, Cancer Research Center, and spent 10 years leading a microtechnology education program at uh, Seattle Central Community College. She left Seattle Central to work at Geospiza Inc., a bioinformatics software company and later that was later purchased by Perkin Elmer. In 2009, Dr. Porter started Digital World Biology, which you can reach at dwbio.com, a company that develops molecular modeling apps, games, and other educational tools for exploring biotech and molecular biology. I highly suggest you check it out. It's really cool. Dr. Porter has been teaching students how to use bioinformatics tools for studying biology for several years and writes about using bioinformatics in her blog, Discovering Biology in a Digital World, which is linked on Digital World Biology site. Currently, Dr. Porter is the principal investigator or PI of a new advanced technology education or ATE project focused on undergraduate research in antibody engineering. She's also the principal investigator of the Biotech Careers ATE project called Bridge to BioLink's Future and a co-PI at Innovate Bio, a national advanced technology center of excellence in biotechnology at Austin Community College. Dr. Porter herself is based out of Seattle, Washington, and is joining us from there today. So she's got a lot of credentials. <laughs> With that, I'm going to let her take it from here. Thanks, Heather. I'm going to share my screen here, and then we'll get started. So today, I'm going to talk, as, as Heather mentioned, about exploring the microbiome. And we'll go all the way from Little Bub's Litter Box to all kinds of microbiome careers and things you can do when you're studying the microbiome. So the talk is gonna be in three parts. The first part will go through kind of introduction and the careers and some fun facts about the microbiome. The second part is gonna talk, I'm gonna talk about little Bub and Danny and how, the micro, how people get data out of the microbiome. And then the third part, we'll go through some of Little Bub's data and look at some of the things that we can learn. Okay, so first of all, some fun facts. Um, this is a fun fact that isn't on here, but when I got my PhD, the only bacteria we could study were bacteria that we could grow. That is, we had to be able to get a sample, we had to be able to grow them on some kind of media. Some people could do fancy things like grow bacteria in pressure cookers and autoclaves and weird environments with various gases, but really we were very, very limited. And it wasn't until the next generation sequencing technologies were invented and people started studying the microbiome a few years ago that we could really figure out what all these things were that live in our bodies and live in our environment. So what is the microbiome? Well, it's, it's actually more than bacteria. It's bacteria and their viruses and fungi and archaea and eukaryotes, like amoebas and stuff like that and trypanosomes. So all kinds of organisms that live in any particular environment. And there are, there's really more than one microbiome as well. There's the microbiome in our gut, which I'll talk about later on, but there's the microbiome on our skin, the microbiome in our environment, the microbiome on any surface we can look at, microbiomes in, I don't know, oil wells, microbiomes in rivers. There are lots, lots of different microbiomes. Another thing that I find really amazing about the microbiome is that 
if we think about our microbiomes, there, our microbiome, there's more microbial cells than there are human cells in a human. In fact, 10 times more. And there's over 5,000 species. And if you could actually take all those cells, all that microbiome from your gut and skin and hair and whatever, and weigh it, it'd be about three pounds. So a pretty good chunk of who we are, are our microbes, which I find just really amazing. They also make a large contribution to our metabolism. Our microbes make vitamin K and B vitamins, among others. There's some others that I haven't listed here. And they make neurotransmitters like serotonin that makes you happy and dopamine that makes you excited and gamma amino butyric acid. I mean, all of these things, many of them are produced in part, at least. The levels are regulated by your gut bacteria. So your mood really is based on your gut feeling <laughs> and what your gut, what is what your gut is doing. So it's an interesting, interesting thing. And because of our microbiomes, because of um, all the all the things we're learning about our microbiomes, there've actually there are a lot of jobs in microbiome companies. So I have this site. We have the site called biotechcareers.org that we have built through um, national science through funding from the National Science Foundation. We have information on the site about careers in biotechnology and different areas and stories and people that work in biotech and videos and companies and jobs. I'm gonna show you a little bit about how many jobs there are in biotech, because I think this is a thing that's really useful to know, especially when you're a student and thinking about what you might wanna do after you go to school. And I'll talk about jobs related to microbiomes. So if we look at biotech jobs, and we're at our site, and we click that link, we come to a page where we have some different ways to search biotechnology jobs. One of the easiest ways is to just click this orange button where it says search for jobs. And when you do, it will automatically fill in the search term with biotechnology. And if you do this, it'll fill it in with wherever you are in the country, but you can change it to buy, you can change it to United States or Seattle or California or wherever, wherever you like. And when you do that, this was on Sunday, I took a look at this, I could see that there were over, there are 5,058 jobs in biotechnology in the United States. Sometimes there is as, as many as 11,000. So it varies quite a bit. But you can see there's a lot. And if you kind of scroll through, you can see there's a lot of different kinds of jobs as well that require a lot of different kinds of training. I can also look at um, explore biotechnology by looking at biotech companies, which I'm going to do here, and show you on our site we have maps that you can use to explore what biotechnology is all over the world. You can either click a state like Texas and see what biotechnology is like in Texas. Or you can click the map of the United States and zoom in different parts of this, parts of the country, zoom in and out and see what things are in different states from that perspective. Or since biotechnology is a worldwide, um, worldwide enterprise, you can see what biotech companies are all over the world, which is kind of exciting. We also on the site organize companies by the kinds of activities that they're involved in. And you can see here, we've, we have um, almost 9,000 different companies and we have them grouped by 556 different business activities. So they, they do a lot of things. And we take a kind of loose view of biotechnology as well. We kind of look at any kind of company where the same skills that you would use in biotechnology would be important in working in that company. So if I click this link, I go to a page that has lists of entry-level jobs. It has kind of information broken down by different areas. And then it has these 556 business areas. And if I scroll down or go to the next page here, eventually I come to a business area where you can see it's got the microbiome. Notice in our um, word cloud here, the size of the word relates to the number of companies that list that activity as something that they're involved in. 
So microbiome, it's a good size, good size chunk of companies. And if I were to click that link, I come to a page where I see 139 companies that do something related to the microbiome in um, 185 locations. We have a map so we can zoom in and out. And then we have also broken down all those companies by other things that they work on. So it shows us that of these 139 employers, 34 work on something related to therapeutics with the microbiome. We've got 23 working on synthetic biology. Uh, 11 companies, 11 microbiome companies work on skin. Okay, and they're working on treatments for acne, they're working on skin care and the best bacteria, they're working on understanding what soaps you may want to use or not use to um, have the best microbiome and the healthiest skin. There are companies working on agriculture and the microbiome, companies working on probiotics so that you can um, have a good, healthy gut. Uh, companies working on animal nutrition and diagnostics and food and cosmetics, all kinds of things are related to the microbiome. Below the map here, we have, uh, if I were to scroll down, I'd see all those links to all those 139 employers, and I could click any of these links and learn more about what those employers do. And I'm going to show you some examples here because I think these are kind of neat. So here's one example where um, call it, the company's called SynLogic. And if I, um, if I were to click this link, I would be able to look at their website. And I can also see that they've hired students from community colleges. And what SynLogic does is they're working on engineering E. coli. Well, you may or may not know that E. coli is a normal constituent of your microbiome. But what they're trying to do is they're trying to engineer E. coli so it digests phenylalanine. Why is that important? Well, you may have heard if you in your genetics class about a disease called phenylketonuria or PKU. Every newborn baby in the United States is screened, has a little um, drop of blood taken from their heel when they're born and they screen this to see if that baby has PKU. This is really important because if a baby has PKU, their parents can use a special diet and they can minimize some of the problems that would be associated with this genetic disease because these people accumulate phenylalanine and phenylalanine unfortunately is toxic to brain cells so they have special diets that are low and lower in phenylalanine and you know less problematic but it's but just because there's a special diet doesn't mean it's easy for these kids or easy for these families. In fact, it's pretty hard. And so if you could have some kind of treatment like bacteria in your gut that would help you, that would be a really nice thing to have. And I believe they're even recruiting for clinical trials right now. They're also working on therapies related to the microbiome to improve how anti-cancer drugs work because it turns out that cancer drugs may or may not work as well, depending on the bacteria in your gut that metabolize them. Another company that works on the microbiome is Pivot Bio. Now, what they're trying to do is they're in agricultural biotechnology and they're engineering microbes that, so that they'll fix nitrogen and release inorganic phosphate. So you would take a seed, seeds and dip it in these bacteria and the bacteria would be around and would help provide fertilizer in a sense for, for the plants. So it pro promotes plant growth. This one is interesting as well, Locust Biosciences. They're doing some really fancy things. So since we can know some of the sequences of bacteria in our gut, which we'll talk about later on, we can actually use those sequences as a way to um, attack those bacteria or kill those bacteria if they're bad. So what this company is doing is they are making phage that have um, CRISPR sequences and a protease called Cas, or nuclease, sorry, called Cas. And the phage are going to deliver the CRISPR sequence 
and the Cas, the Cas nuclease to problematic bacteria like Clostridium difficile and um, bad E. coli. And so you could kill off, selectively kill off the bacteria that cause problems. Last, the last company I'm going to talk about is Animal Biome. And the reason I'm talking about these guys is that these guys collaborated on Lil Bub's story. Now they work on in the veterinary area and pets. So what they do is if you were to have a fecal sample from your dog or cat, they would do a microbiome analysis on that fecal sample and they would do a metabolic profile and they'd figure out um, how the microbiome components, how the members of the microbiome might contribute to problems with digestion or skin issues in dogs and cats, and um, maybe even anxiety. I saw a paper from Perina where they said that anxious dogs, you can sometimes treat that with probiotics that have bacteria that will, I guess, make more serotonin and make the dogs less anxious. In this case, I think they're thinking about food allergies because animals sometimes develop food allergies. And so understanding the microbiome can help with that, help prevent that. So I wanna stop for a couple of minutes and ask if anybody has any questions. Oops. Are, Heather, are you seeing any questions yet? Okay, well, we'll continue on then. Yeah, I'm not seeing any questions yet. <laughs> okay. All right. So there's our introduction, some of the fun facts, some of those companies you could work on if you think the microbiome is really interesting, which it microbiology is in a golden age. And there are a lot of really interesting things to do in that area now. So now what I want to do is talk about the kitty microbiome and how it is people get information from the microbiome. So I'll tell you a little bit about Danny and little Bub and about DNA sequencing, and then one of the special techniques that is used in DNA sequencing and was used in little Bub's sequence. So I got interested in this because I read this blog post on phase genomics about little Bub and her story. I'd never heard really before that of a cat who had accomplished so much, but she's a published author, a talk show host, movie star, musician, philanthropist. Um, little, little Bub did a lot <laughs> in her lifetime. And people even found 22 new microbes by studying Little Bub's genome. It's actually pretty, pretty amazing. Little Bub has since passed on, I'm sad to say, but she was, she was quite a cat. So Little Bub collaborated with, um, with Phase Genomics and um, the Animal Biome Company. She uh, contributed her litter box <laughs> uh, droppings. Danny, a normal cat, contributed his, and they were able to compare them and see what was different about the two pets. As you can see, little Bub looks a little bit unusual. If you go to YouTube, you can find all kinds of little Bub YouTube videos. She's pretty cute. She has a form of dwarfism that kept her small all her life. She has some jaw abnormalities. Little Bub didn't have any teeth. And she uh, actually had 22 toes. So a lot more toes than the normal cat as well. But I did read about her and I, she could, even though she didn't have te teeth, she could still eat regular dry hard cat food. She was quite accomplished. Little Bub even had her genome sequenced, and this was done through crowdfunding. So her whole genome sequenced, and they were able to figure out what mutations were causing her dwarfism and the extra toes. And this is wild. One of the mutations, I love this, is a missing A in, C, in a CAT sequence. But about her microbiome. So as I mentioned before, the microbiome is more than just bacteria. It can be eukaryotic cells like amoeba or um, trypanosomes. We could have yeast or other kinds of fungi. Um, and there can be bacteria as well. And all of these have genomes. Um, here, 
we've got linear chromosomes. Here we've got lots of linear chromosomes of different sizes. Bacteria have circular chromosomes for the most part, but then we also have little plasmids, which are circular pieces of DNA, and there can be viruses in, the, in that mix as well. Both viruses that infect eukaryotic cells and viruses that infect bacteria. Oh, and archaea too, I forgot, I should mention those also. So the way that we know about all the members of the microbiome is really by isolating the cells and popping them open and sequencing their DNA. And when this happens, people do this and they get small sequences that they call reads. They can take parts of the sequence that match each other and find where they match and put them together into bigger sequences. And then they can put those sequences together and assemble genomes. The way I think about this sometimes is to think about having a phone book and imagine if you had a phone book, because this is about the right size of a genome, and you were able to chop it up into small bits and then somebody asks, asked you to put it back together. Well, you'd have to do it by trying to find matching words or matching names or letters that matched. It's kind of the same sort of thing. Luckily for us though, we have computers which can help a lot for assembling our reads into contigs, contig contiguous sequences, which contigs is short for, and then into genomes. The problem though is with, um, with the microbiome is that we're not just looking at one genome that we're trying to put together, we're looking at multiple genomes. And the way people make the samples for studying these multiple genomes is to take the whole mix, right? You know, samples of poop from a litter box, break it all up, chop all the DNA up, and then they've got all these different pieces. And we know that many of these microbes share the same genes. So how, how do we put this together, but, but do it right and see that, you know, different, um, each genome for its own organism? Well, that happens because of a technology that was discovered a few years ago called Hi-C. So what people learn is, learned is that uh, through basic science that genomes have structures. They have a three-dimensional structure and parts of that structure are closer to each other than others. So they figured out that if you were to take DNA and add formalin, Okay, you could cross-link the DNA and join these two uh, pieces together. And if you were to digest the rest, you'd have a fragment like this. And if you were to ligate, join these ends together, you make this kind of circle thing. And then you could sequence this. And by seeing which piece is close to the other, you could figure out kind of something about the physical location of where these different DNA molecules are, okay? If you sequence this junction, you know the red piece is close to the blue piece. Well, the way we can use that is that if you take a microbiome sample and you cross-link everything before you digest it and chop it all up, you can figure out which pieces of DNA must have come from the same cell. And that's really useful because you can use that to help you assemble that DNA and put your genomes together. So here we've, again, we've got our crosslink and our fragment and we ligate it and we seek sequence adjust junctions. So anything that is together here must have been part of that same genome. So now when we're doing shotgun sequencing, we've got all these pieces of DNA that are crosslinked and we can sort it all out. We can say, oh yeah, these guys came from yeast, these guys came from this bacteria, these guys came from this other bacteria. And that is really helpful because we also know, um, we all can also use this as sequencing chromosomes from an organism. So people have used it with looking at the mosquitoes that transmitted the Zika, Zika virus, figured out their genome sequence. People have used it was studying the, um, the microbiomes of cows 
and figuring out that there were like 913 different microbial genomes in a cow, it's pretty amazing. They can uh, connect the viruses with their hosts. As you know, if a virus is cross-linked to a, um, a genome, you know that virus was inside of that cell. Okay, so now a little bit about the data, right? Now we're gonna look at, or, or, that's how they get the data. Now we're gonna talk about what we can do with it. And I thought I had a spot for questions. Actually, I wanna stop here and see, are there any questions at this time? I'm not seeing any come through yet, but guys, okay. if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the Q&A or in the chat. Okay. All right, so now I'm going to talk about kind of the more complicated stuff. That is, once we have this, this DNA and these sequences, and we know about the different bacteria, what can we do with them? And how is this useful? How is this helpful to us? So these are some data from Phase Genomics. This is from their website. And oops, let me go back for a little bit back for just a minute, we can see that, um, so we're going to go on and see about little bub. So I'm going to just keep going here. Uh, Phase Genomics has all their information um, available on their website here. And you'll have a slide, I can give you the slides too and give you the URL a little bit later. But if you go to this URL, you can get and download all the microbiome data from little bub. And they have microbiome data from a human. And they have also microbiome data from sewage wastewater, which is pretty interesting. And if you um, get that data, it's going to look a lot like DNA sequences. But some of them, they've analyzed some of the data for you as well. We can ask all kinds of questions about it and see some interesting things. For example, sometimes you might discover brand new bacteria, species that nobody knew existed before. We might find, well, we can see how many there are and what the composition is of a microbiome. We can see uh, if there are viruses we, or um, are there bacteriophage, right? That is viruses and infect bacteria. We can see if the bacteria contains plasmids or if there's any kinds of antibiotic resistance genes. We can also look at, uh, like I said, which bacteria are most abundant, which are um, present, and what metabolic genes can we find? Are we finding um, an excess of genes that allow us, allow a, um, in, in the gut that is, allow a dog to better metabolize meat or something, or a cat to better metabolize meat? We, and we can look at how these genes might contribute. We can also compare microbiomes. Uh, here is little bub's microbiome, and I'm comparing just a portion of that to the human microbiome that we have here. And actually, they have a lot more bacterial species on the website than what I'm showing you. But if I look at the top five in each case, I can see for little bub, I've got Clostridia, and um, some other bacteria, Dialister and Parabacteroides and more Clostridium. If I look at human, I've got uh, Actinobacteria and Bacteroides and Burkholderia and Bifidobacterium. So completely different profiles of bacteria in the microbiome. Interestingly, one of the experiments that was done a few years ago they kind of did a, a citizen science experiment. They asked people to, who wanted to participate to send in fecal samples from themselves, but also fecal samples from their pets. And they found that the microbiome of your dog is more similar to your microbiome than it is to other dogs, which is kind of wild, that the microbiome in a family had some simila similarities to each other which maybe makes sense. You know, if your dog licks your face or something like that, they're sharing their microbiome with you. 
okay, a little bit more about how we get some of that data. So if I were to go to that website and click some of these links, I could download the DNA sequences. And I'll show you if I were to take one of the sequences and I copy it, copy the whole sequence, I could go to the NCBI, which is part of the National Institutes of Health, it's um, the National Center for Biotechnology Information. It's actually part of the National Library of Medicine, actually, at the In National Institutes of Health. I can go to the NCBI. I can use a tool called BLAST, which stands for Basic Local Alignment Sequence Tool, to compare my sequences. And I can identify what kinds of genes are in that DNA sequence, because it compares that that sequence to a database of thousands, actually millions of sequences, over a billion sequences in the NCBI databases. So here's what it looks like if I were to do that. I'd have my DNA sequence pasted in here. I would select reference proteins. And I forgot to mention, I in this case, I'm using BLASTX because it translates the nucleotide sequences into amino acids and I can get protein sequences. It's a little easier to do the matching. And when I get a result, I would actually click a button that would say blast, and it would give me the result eventually. And I could see here, this would be my really long DNA sequence. In fact, you see it's 4,200, over 4,250 nucleotides. And each red line, is a part where there is a sequence in the database that matches something in my sequence. So I can see there's like four sets, right, of these red lines. And I could, if I were at NCBI, I could mouse over these and see what they are. So for the first set here, I see that at least the top one is very similar to a kind of protein called a permease. And a permease is a kind of protein that allows material to go back and forth through a cell membrane. If I look at the next one, I see that that sequence is similar to an ABC transporter ATP binding protein, which I know it's a mouthful, but it's a sequence that would kind of move ATP back and forth across the membrane. So the permease might make the membrane more leaky, and this might actually transport ATP in, in or out of the cell. How uh, this protein, I guess we don't know anything about. We just know it's predicted. This last protein is one that binds ATP, which makes a lot of sense, right? If we've got a permease, it makes a membrane leaky. We've got something that transports ATP across the membrane. And now we've got a protein that binds to ATP. It might be able to use ATP in energy production or something else. And if you think about this, that we've got the four proteins together, this kind of organization is something that you may have heard about before because bacteria organize genes together that belong to a, a similar metabolic pathway, and we call these operons. You may have heard of the LAC operon, and if you haven't heard of it, you will hear about it, because it's a group of genes that are involved in metabolizing sugars. This group of genes metabolizes ATP. Okay, some of the other things we can find by looking at doing that same kind of thing with searching our DNA sequences against a database, is we can find that little bub's genome contains genes that um, would give make her bacteria resistant to antibiotics. Antibiotics are made by microbes, so people often call them, abbreviate these antimicrobial resistance genes as AMR genes. Um, Anyway, they're antibiotic resistance genes, and we can also see where they're found. So the color key here has a yellow color if the gene is found on a plasmid, and a blue color if it's found on a genome. 
And we can see that some, and the names of the bacteria are here, some bacteria have these genes in their genome, some have anti antibiotic resistant genes in their, um, on plasmids. Some have more than one gene, okay? And that's, that could be useful information. So I continue on to the next slide here. These are those, th this is that same information, but it's organized in a table. And here you can see, you know, which genes are on plasmids and which genes are part of the genome. And here we have the kind of antibiotic that those bacteria would be resistant to and some of the common names. So we have some bacteria are resistant to aminoglycoside antibiotics like neomycin or canamycin. Uh, some are resistant to penicillin or ampicillin. Some are resistant to clindamycin. Some are resistant to erythromycin. A bunch are resistant to tetracycline. And this is important because if you can imagine, if you were a patient and you were sick, it would be really important that people were to, could treat you with the right antibiotic. And it'd be important, it'd be really helpful if they were to know what kinds of antibiotic resistance genes are found in your gut. Because when you take an antibiotic, if it's not, if it's a broad spectrum antibiotic and it kills off all the bacteria in your gut, that's exactly what it'll, it'll kill off all the susceptible bacteria, but the bacteria like these um, clostridium that are resistant would still be there and would might overpopulate and you might have other problems because of that. It's kind of why a lot of doctors now recommend people take probiotics uh, after they've had antibiotics because to try to repopulate your gut and um, keep from other problems that might be associated. The, another thing we're interested in with antibiotic resistance is that this antibiotic resistance is spread through mobile elements. So the genome kind of stays where it is, right? But there are actually bits of DNA that can move from one, one genome to another. So if you had bacteria that were to lice and they had a antibiotic resistance gene in their genome, that could incorporate into a new cell. If you had a virus that infected bacteria that had that resistance gene, the virus could transmit that resistance gene into a new cell. Or if you have antibiotic resistance genes on plasmids, plas plasmids actually code for their own transfer to new cells. They can, they can make themselves spread. And so this is an important thing to know too, is we said where those genes are located with they're on a plasmid or they're on a chromosome. This is kind of why we want to know some of that. And it's information that we get out of the microbiome. So I mentioned that there are companies that are actually looking at the microbiome components and the genes in the microbiome to try to figure out Oh, how to improve your nutritional situation or to improve pet nutrition. One of the things that one of the ways they do this is they can get all those DNA sequences from your microbiome. They're actually probably not going to be copying and pasting them to the NCBI like I did. They can use computer programs to compare those sequences to a database. And they can figure out what genes are in your gut that are involved in which in certain metabolic pathways. Now I know this is way too tiny to read, but these are several different metabolic pathways that the bacteria in little bubs gut possessed. Uh, this diagram at the top was a phylogenetic tree showing different bacteria. And 
if I kind of blow this up to look at a couple of examples, I can see here, I pulled out um, the beta oxidation pathway, which is involved in metabolizing fat. The yellow mark shows wherever there's a gene that does that. And it shows we have a lot of bacteria here that contain this pathway and help metabolize fat. If we look at the next line that I put here, this one, uh, this pathway is that ABC transport system that I mentioned earlier when we looked at the operon. So we see that little bubs bacteria, a lot of them have genes involved in transporting ATP. And here are some others that we have that can transport ATP. And so we can learn a little bit about her metabolic capabilities by looking at the genes and looking at the metabolic pathways that are inside her gut. Uh, people are interested in this because they have found there are cases where um, there's been studies where there have been identical twins and um, one twin, uh, these were kids in Africa, there was like a case where they had one twin that was starving and another twin that was doing okay. And the difference between these twins were their microbiomes. If they took the micro, if they took um, some samples from the twin that was healthy and gave it to the one that was starving, it would be able to uh, metabolize food better and uh, would no longer be starving. It's kind of wild, I think. Okay, I want to uh, tell you about a really great book that is really readable and really fun. And I really highly recommend this, which is a book by an author called Ed Yong. Uh, I contain multitudes and he talks all about, he has all kinds of microbiome stories and stories about, um, oh, when, when microbes populate your body, apparently it's before you're born. And when you also get microbiomes during birth and all kinds of stories about the microbiome, it's pretty amazing. And I want to also thank Phase Genomics because they let me use some of their slides and because they're making their data publicly available. I think that's pretty cool and pretty useful. And now I want to uh, see if I can have, answer any questions for you. We did have one question in the chat. Um, what would cause little bub's abnormalities? Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, I'll go back to that. All right. Oops. Yeah, so the osteopetrosis, that's the abnormality that relates to dwarfism in little bub. This is a disease that present, prevented her bones from growing property, properly. Um, it was in a gene called rank, and it had to do with bone growth. And I actually don't remember the gene, the exact gene that was involved in having extra, extra toes but I know they found it. <laughs> and you could get this paper, which is pretty cool. This one, this uh, the one that I have a picture of here was a preprint, but it, I believe it's been peer reviewed and now it's been um, published and is available in different, different journals now that you could read. So more questions. Yes, we have two questions. Um, what jobs are there in microbiomes for agriculture and oil industries? Okay, well, let me, let, you know, we can take a look. Hold on just a minute. I will open up biotech careers and we'll go see. I'm not actually sure about oil, but I can definitely tell you about some different microbiome jobs. Okay, so now I've got the Biotech Careers website open. And I'm going to go to Biotech Jobs. 
and I'm going to just say uh, search jobs. There's, I'll, I'll show you a couple different ways to look. So right now, uh, yeah, that's just Seattle. Let's look at the US. So if I look at the US right now for biotech jobs, yesterday I only had 5,000. Today I have 5,890. If I'll look at Texas, so I just typed TX and hit return. So I've got 120. All right, some of these jobs are going to be microbiome jobs, but not all. I could also go to, um, I could also change the word I search with. And if I look at microbiome jobs, I just typed microbiome and I click find jobs. I see two in Texas, but there's probably more than that because not everything is gonna be classified exactly as microbiome. If I look in the United States and I search, I see 51 microbiome jobs. Okay, so microbiome jobs related to agriculture. Uh, we can kind of scroll down. We can see that there are um, soil microbiome research associate. Okay, that's gonna be agriculture, more soil microbiome. Oh, well that's, these guys are working on cosmetics. Interesting. Uh, creative, creative graphic designer working on microbiome stuff that's spore-based. Okay, I have no idea really what they're doing, but it's interesting. Um, phylogen, they're looking at the environment, monitoring the environmental microbiome, unlocking genetics of things that appear on every surface of the planet. I don't know. <laughs> uh, let's see. We've got these guys, inflammatory microbiome. So um, let's see, if we're looking soil, I could, sometimes I can play with this and I can say, um, and um, agriculture, and see that takes me down to seven, but that doesn't, I, I'm probably not getting everything that exists. I'm also gonna go now to, I'll just go to the companies and we'll look at that. So the way I can look at microbiome and the companies and see what kinds of jobs there might be is remember I could click business activities. I can scroll down. And find microbiome here and click that. And I can see here that I had this 139 employers. So I could uh, narrow this down by looking at ag biotech or agriculture. And we can try, try that. And if I look down farther, I can scroll down and I can look at these companies and see um, what kinds of things what kinds of things they do. So like uh, adaptive symbiotic technologies, they've got seed and plant treatments. So that based on um, fungi, so they probably, oh, they're in Seattle, cool. <laughs> they probably have jobs for microbiologists and quality control and um, uh, people who are growing strains and looking at, looking at microbes, um, ag biome, they're looking at the crop biome, um, trying to figure out what different strains are. Anyway, you, you can see there's nitrogen fixing biome, uh, solve. These guys are looking at seed treatment and um, looking at things that enhance seed germination and plant growth. Now oil specifically, I'm not sure. I think they're, I'm pretty sure there are. Uh, jobs related to it, but I haven't um, looked at everything that's in this database. I also want to stress, I'm going to go back to all microbiome companies here too, that I would show you one other way to look at careers, that our database, we have a lot of companies in here, but we don't have every single company in the United States in here. There's way more 
right? So it's, we're only looking at a fraction of the jobs that are out there. As far as the kinds of jobs, yes. We can also go to um, career information and filter. And that shows us 62 of these companies that have career pages. And if I go to any of one of these companies and I look at um, their career page, like we'll look at a, oh, ag biome, I guess. I could look at careers and I could get a really good idea about what kinds of jobs. So these guys have um, account executives, technical service representatives, computational biologists, um, people designing proteins that kill insects, patent attorneys, product managers, quality, um, research and development receptionists, and people who are trying to hire people to work at this company. So you can get a lot of information about what careers are there and what's available. Hopefully I answered the question. The other question that we have is, what applications are there for collecting sewage microbiomes? Oh my gosh, this has been, this has been a really important one lately um, because of SARS, <laughs> all right? So people have been using sewage monitoring to figure out where outbreaks are and to figure out, um, particularly on college, camp, college and university campuses, they've been trying to um, determine where there might be problems and where there might be sick people. Uh, for example, they've been monitoring wastewater from dormitories. And so if you find that one dorm has a high amount of SARS in the sewage, because SARS comes through <laughs> your gut, Okay, you can, um, you'd know, right, that there might be somebody who's sick in that dorm and you would wanna make sure that all the students get tested. So that's, that's one application. Another application might be if you're interested in outbreaks of um, bacteria that are related to, bacteria related to foodborne diseases, bacteria or uh, actually eukaryotes related to foodborne diseases, you could look at sewage as well to try to identify those. I think there, um, yeah, I think people have also been looking at sewage to identify different uh, drug metabolites in city water as well, but I don't know as much about that. Are there more questions? Not seeing any more questions. Uh, Professor Villarreal, do you have any more from your class? <laughs> oh, we are good. Very nice. I'm just going to wait a little bit just in case anybody's typing. I don't want to miss okay. anyone. <laughs> well, it's fun talking with everybody. There will be, uh, by the way, in a couple of weeks, Innovate Bio is having a webinar on um, Friday afternoon. It's not this week, but next week, I think. And there will be a couple of scientists joining from um, that uh, were recruited by Biorad to talk about wastewater sequencing, or maybe not sequencing, but at least using using PCR to monitor wastewater and see what they can find. So if you're interested in that, uh, I think that'll be an interesting talk. And actually, maybe I can even put this in chat. Just take me a moment to find it. But um, it's, it's a free webinar. I think it'll be kind of fun to hear. Yeah, advanced PCR techniques. All right. Very cool. Yeah, I will add that to our um, thank you email. So everyone will get that link 
Um, so if you aren't able to bookmark it now because you're on a mobile device or anything like that, you'll get it in your uh, your thank you email. <laughs> I'll, so. I'll also put in um, biotechcareers.org. That's the yes. the site I was using to look at all the job information. <laughs> yes, I'm going to be poking around in there for a little bit, I think, <laughs> this afternoon. It's very interesting to see all of that. So I'll go back on video here. So thank you so much, Dr. Porter, for that fantastic uh, presentation. I know I learned a whole lot about uh, the different careers in biotechnology and about uh, gene sequencing and all that fun stuff, the microbiomes that we have living all over us. So <laughs> thank you so much. OK. Thanks. All right. Thank you, everyone, for coming. And uh, the recording will be posted uh, as soon as we are able to do so. And you will be getting a uh, email. You'll also be getting a uh, pop up for a survey. If you would fill that out and let us know what you think, I would really appreciate it. So thank you again, Dr. Porter. And I hope everyone has a great afternoon. Thanks. Thanks. Bye, everyone. <laughs>